Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back, jacked up about this week's pod with a former opponent of mine, both at the University of Washington while he played at USC and in the NFL. His name is Ronnie Lott. But before we get there, I want to remind everybody about my upcoming epic trip to Mount Everest. I'm ready to take that beast on here any day, trying to become the first NFL player to ever climb the seven summits. It's going to be a monster, monster challenge for me to try to get up and try to get down. If you want to follow that journey, you can do so at www.markpattisonnfl.com. And you can track the journey and uh, see the progress on my blog that is on the website um, over there. So all that said, I wanted to introduce and bring on a guy I've known for a long time. You know, we had uh, two different careers. I was just a guy that passed through the NFL. And Ronnie Lott um, has made just about every famous team there ever was. There's many people out there that argue he might be the best at his position defensively um, of all time. But uh, however you want to slice it, he's a good, good guy at the end of the day. And uh, so jacked up and happy that, uh, Ronnie, you decided to come on the pod. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm looking forward to uh, chatting and hearing a little bit more about something that I think is a really amazing feat. I've had the good fortunes of meeting someone, a young lady, who was able to do what you're getting ready to do and take on that accomplishment of being able to, you know, scale and do something that a lot of people are are really uh challenged to do and that is to breathe rare air and uh, when you think about rare air uh, not everyone has the capacity to make that happen so good luck with that because i think it's going to be an incredible uh chance to see not just the peaks but also the rare air of what so many people that don't ever get a chance to experience and that is something that uh very few have been able to 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 make happen so yeah man kudos to you for thinking about it kudos to you for going after it and kudos to you because it's an incredible challenge and um and all the best to you with this yeah, no, thanks, Ronnie. And, and I want to dig into that just a little bit because it's not like I ran, you know, I fell out of bed one day and said, hey, let's go do this. You know, there's a whole, whole kind of backstory. But as I've got deeper and deeper into this, I'm, I'm actually not just going to take on one, but I'm going to take on two. So when you get to Camp 4, which is known as the death zone, 26,000 feet, um, my, my goal and attempt will be to go up Mount Everest, come down back into the sad, saddle 14 hours later, rest for a few, and then go up the fourth highest mountain in the world called Lhotse, and then come down the other side. That is rare air. There's only a handful of guys who've actually pulled that off. And I hope to be, you know, one in that group. And, you know, one of the things that I did, and this is the one of the things that I always loved when I, you know, I played down in New Orleans and I was, you know, I was coming in in the forward wide receiver set and always being the outside guy, usually my route was to come inside and head directly towards you at the safety position, which is always a, a terrifying thing. And uh, one of the things that, as it relates again, back to mountain climbing, is what it takes is full 100% commitment. And and I, I've done that by literally moving my entire life to Sun Valley, training at 6,000 feet, going up and down the mountain every day, uh, doing CrossFit in the morning and taking my body to a place that I didn't even know it could possibly get. And one of the things that I always loved about watching you play is that you were the most committed guy on the field. I think you had some other guys on that San Francisco team that also held that same kind of commitment to excellence and win. But you just seemed to be one level above everybody else. And, and I want to go back to like when you're growing up and you're going to Eisenhower High School – like, where did that thing kick in for you? You know, you were skilled, but skill only takes you so far. And that's that hard work and determination that takes you to a whole different place that, you know, amazing possibilities can happen. Yeah, I think where it starts is that it starts with the people that you're around and the people that you have a chance to interact with. And uh, I think one of the great things that it started with with me was my parents. Um, I have two incredible parents that 
shared with me uh, the things that they did to do and create in a dynamic around our family. And that was, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to do the best that we can do. We're going to work hard. Uh, we're going to find ways to add value to our community. And one of the great things that my dad, uh, growing up in the military and being around that was that you saw there were certain characteristics of things that he would do, sh shining his belt buckle, uh, shining his shoes. And you would see that there was a commitment to not only making it, you know, perfect, but a commitment of saying, I'm going to even go further. I want to see myself. And, and my point is that, you know, all of a sudden you start to hear those type of characteristics and you start to pay attention to them. And then um, being a, a sports fan, I, I grew up watching Brooks Robinson and Frank Robinson and watching their commitment and what they were able to do with the Orioles and how phenomenal they were as individuals and as athletes. And and then I saw the Redskins and Sonny Jurgensen and, and Charlie Taylor. And those were, you know, the guys that I, I watched. And, you know, the Over the Hill gang was an incredible group of guys that said, no, we're, we might be over the hill, but we're going to get to the Super Bowl. And they got to the Super Bowl. And and then, and then along the way, you know, you watch the Celtics. And then if you watch the Celtics, you watch the great Bill Russell. Yeah. You watch the great Casey Jones. And, and my point is that all of a sudden you're starting to see and identify people who had, you know, really amazing characteristics. And, um, and then the journey from there as I was growing up and living in Washington, D.C., and then moving to California, just – Things continue to flourish. People I kept bumping into. And, um, you know, here I was at the White House last week with Jim Brown. And I had met Jim Brown when I was a, when I was a senior at USC. And we were trying to, Marcus Allen and I were trying to, you know, get into a party at his house. And, and, and the great Jim Brown uh, came over and said, hey, man, you're on my grass. You can't be standing on my grass. So, <laughs> you know, you, you, you have those, you know, those encounters of people like that, or you have a moment where Deacon Jones, obviously one of the greats that ever played the game saying, uh -huh. Hey, I want you to be the best. Even if you're going to be the best garbage, man, I want you to be the best. And so you had those encounters and I've been fortunate because a lot of those encounters are like being on the yellow brick road and life is around trying to stay on the yellow brick road. I think a lot of us are constantly as you are right now, trying to stay on the yellow brick road of having those kind of moments of success. And, and so to me, sports has played a big role in, it, in my family, my parents, and then, of course, you know, the coaches and all the people that have been associated with over those years have kind of helped me stay on their yellow brick road. Well, there's a great saying that uh, I've really followed, which is success leaves clues. And I think some of the things that you're talking about, um, you know, of these different famous uh, players, uh, they're famous because of the hard work ethic that they brought to the game. And, you know, you've been around sport a long time. I've been around sport in a long time. And there were a heck of a lot of guys that were way more talented than me. But it was because of just that hard work ethic and that attention to detail and everything I learned really from Don James, my college coach, that really paved the way towards that whole thing. Success leaves clues. And then watching other guys that were more successful, you know, that were older than me, they go through and like, hmm, I think they're on to something interesting. There was a general that uh, uh, he's got this famous commencement speech and he talks about making your bed. I'm not sure if you heard it, Ronnie, but. Yes, um, I have. It's incredible. And it, I, I think it gets down to, you know, where you're talking about your dad, you know, polishing his belt. And it's that same type of idea. It's just like when you first get up, make your bed, feel like that's the, that, that you've accomplished something and you're well way on to, to other great things that are going to happen that day. And I've, I've followed that advice, you know, all the way. And that's where I get up, I brush my teeth, I'm out the door after making my bed and, you know, onto the gym and, and getting my day kicked off in, in all the right ways. Um, as I was going back and I was, you know, I was, you know, doing some research on your background, obviously I, I, I knew it 
you know, to a, to a degree because I've known you for a while and we, we, we played against each other back in the day, but, um, it was interesting to me that of, of the four Super Bowls and these different teams and these different amazing players around, and you guys had one heck of a run um, back at USC when you were there with Marcus and, and the other players. We'll get into that a little bit more. But you said your best time in all of sport um, was when you were going to Eisenhower High School. And I was wondering, you know, like, why was that? Was it because you had a great mentor and coach? or that the, the guys that were around you that pushed you, or where was that in the universe that made you say that? Yeah, the reason why is that there were things that you didn't think about, meaning the, 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 the stakes at that time were just the stakes of joy. The stakes were not around the consequences of whether you're going to win the Pac-12 or whether you're going to uh, not win the Pac-12. The stakes were just you know totally different. They were totally innocent. They were totally unique from the standpoint that, you know, you, you, you got excited because you could listen to a speech that George Patton would, he gave and and that speech was phenomenal. And the reason that it was phenomenal is that it came from a place where you knew that he was trying to inspire Americans and inspire people. And, and, and my point is that, um, you know, as we get older and as we go through what we go through, the stakes change. And so that experience of being able to have that purity, those kind of moments, as you pointed out, in terms of just shining your buckle or making those things, you know, mean a lot, it, it provided value and it provided the right characteristics. And, 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 and the reason I thought that that's a great time is that, no better time in your life when you're sitting there just having fun and waking up thinking about having fun. And so <laughs> that, that changes, of course, it changes because you got to get a degree and you got to get your degree and you're trying to do that in four years. And when you're trying to do that in four years, that means it takes sacrifice. It means you got to go to summer school. It means you got to do a lot of things that other people are not willing to do. And so my point is that, those kind of things change your life for a lot of reasons. And yet in high school, you know, that was not necessarily something that I had to worry about in high school, high school, you just, you know, you, you came home, you had your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. In my case, I had my bologna and, and mustard sandwich. And, and, and that was, you know, the, the way that I, you know, enjoyed my life, you know, listening to Muhammad Ali, on the radio, not seeing them, but listening to that fight and listening to some of those great moments early on of watching him, excuse me, listening to his fights on the radio. And, and you, you start to understand that you can, you can visualize, you can visualize a a punch. You can visualize a moment of being knocked down and you can visualize those things because you're listening to them. So yeah, those those things to me in life are, you know, the, the joy and the purity of them. And you're, and you're constantly trying to find and seek those moments again. And, 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 and they all are, to me, they all come from, you know, a part of the joy of life. And, and hopefully like I saw this past week when I saw the joy of Eddie's daughter and, and, and what I saw was, so much love of him that she had for him and what he was able to accomplish. And, and I remember sitting there, you know, thinking how amazing that had to feel to, for her to be there with him. And, and so those are, you know, unique things that we forget about that brings a lot of value in our lives. And, um, I'm always interested in trying to see and find those kind of, you know, gems. And, and, and in high school, you, you, you're around that you're, you, you see it, you, 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 you love it. It's, you know, you're, it, it's nothing, nothing but just pure joy when you, when you win and, and nothing but pure headaches when you lose because the loss is so devastating because it's a loss. I think you're talking about uh, Eddie D, uh, who was just pardoned by President Trump. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I would. Yeah, I, w- I was talking about that with his daughter because yeah. I think that you know sometimes it's the little things that you notice that make life so so rich and so valuable. And I know in my life, you know, sometimes when you see things that 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 people don't get a chance to see, then you get to see the reason why it's important. And and you know that that moment will always be a moment for me that will make me reflect on my own daughters and how special and how much I care about them and how much I love them and how much I want to make sure that I'm doing the things that I need to do to protect them and give them everything that I can. Well, look, I've got two daughters, 21 and 23. My 23-year-old graduated uh, from the mighty USC Trojans, which was a little hard for me to chew at the time, being a Washington Husky. But, you know, great, great institution. And it doesn't really matter what she her choice would have been, whether it would have been community college or, or, or USC. You know, it's just... It's all good. I love them both the same. And um, it's just been a joy to watch them in their authentic way, shape and mold. And, you know, I want to go back to what you're talking about, like the pure joy, the, the footloose and fa- fancy footed um, ways that, that many of us are in high school when you don't have the, all those responsibilities and you can just be, be who you are for who you are and not what you have to do. And all the responsibilities of a family or paying a mortgage or, being that responsible, you know, NFL player that, you know, you have duties and responsibilities and, you know, they, at the end of the day, you got to show up and there's expectations. And, um, and so a lot of it is just the joy of the game. Um, You like so many um, others, I was in this position when um, you were probably one of the better athletes on the team. You were playing both offensive and defensive at that spot. You go on, I'm sure you got letters all over the country but you end up going to USC back in the day, back in the seventies, early eighties, USC had it going on. John Robinson was the coach and you end up going there. Um, was there ever a point in time where you either didn't want to go there or you went there and you didn't want to play either corner or safety for USC? In other words, you really wanted to play offense? No, I never had that, that, that moment in my life. Uh, I didn't have, the only time that I had a moment before that was um, there was a period where, you know, I wanted to go to UCLA. And the reason I wanted to go there was I was a big fan of John Wooden. I was a big fan of a lot of the players that had gone to school there. And, and, and so, you know, growing up in Southern California, watching John Wooden, watching that whole, um, um, you know, run that he had and, and, and the, and the uh, philosophies and the, the ways that they went about it. I, it, it, I was drawn to even thinking about, you know, the possibilities of just being near him. And so, um, yeah, I thought I was going to go there. And then uh, unfortunately, you know, in life you find, and sometimes things are said and, in this case, one of the coaches said, you know, what well, we don't, we, we, we don't, you know, freshmen can't play. And, and so in those moments, when somebody says that you, you're kind of like, what? And, and next thing you know, John Robinson says, Hey, if you think you're good enough, give it a shot. And, and, and to me, life is when people tell you, give it a shot. And, um, you know, you're giving it a shot here pretty soon and and and, and you're you're gonna go after it and you're gonna do everything you possibly can. And and when John Robinson said that, that kind of resonated with me and it made me realize that you know, maybe maybe I should take that that shot and maybe I should be courageous enough to, you know, try it. And so that's what got me to uh to USC. Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting because I've I've talked a lot because I really believe it about John Wooden's pyramid of success and the very top rung of the 25 different um, uh, individual building blocks uh, is this word called competitive greatness. But really what that's all about is about um, loving the process and being willing to commit, again, 
to each and every step. And sometimes it's fast and sometimes it's slow. And, and for everybody, it's different, but you got to be committed to it and don't give up. And that's the main thing. And there's just far too many people that say they're going to do something and then fall off the cliff for whatever reason, something gets a little tough and they stop. And that's the worst thing. The last thing you can do, you know, if you're committed to that end goal, you do need to keep going. And it's, it's also interesting to me that not only, you know, you're, you're a guy that epitomizes the word competitive greatness because you love the process. But back in the day, there weren't that many freshmen playing um, college football. It's not like today where everybody's going through these different sequences of, you know, specialized club sports, going to Nike uh, elite uh, camps and all these different things. It's just not like that. And so the kids, generally speaking, aren't as big and fast and strong as they are uh, today. And so it really speaks a lot to kind of your your physical stature to be able to take on, you know, big fullbacks and, and linemen coming down the field and trying to block you to be able to be out there playing as a freshman. That's That's really remarkable. Well, I don't know. You know, the things I always thought, and which I really believe, is that, you know, and I think we all have, there's a, there's a, a, a movie I think called, uh, everybody's all American. And, and in that movie, um, he's trying to figure it all out. He's trying to figure out what he's going to do. He's gonna, trying to figure out his life and trying to figure out a lot of things. And I think that we all kind of go through those, you know, those journeys in life of what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. And, and we make choices and, and, and sometimes those choices become, you know, choices that are good. And then we make choices that sometimes are not the best choices in life. And, and, um, I, I, I've, I've always felt like you're wherever you go, you know, hopefully God has given you a chance to be able to say that you can make the most of your life and, and try to exhaust every moment you can. And, and, and that's kind of, you know, something that I've always felt is, you know, are you, are you going to exhaust life and are you trying to play it and do all you can? And, and, and as my dad told me, you know, try not to have any regrets. And he's never, my dad lives his life, not having regrets. And, and that's something that I've tried to live my life, not having regrets and just, play as hard as you can and, and give all you can. And hopefully you do it the right way with, you know, all the right characteristics. Well, talk about no regrets. You end up making the right decision to go to USC. And as you know, uh, you know, it worked out well for me at Washington and worked out well for you at USC. You become an all American and ultimately a first round pick to the San Francisco 49ers. And it was really interesting because that was kind of the start of the whole Bill Walsh thing. And, you know, he just had this vision of way he wanted to create a team, both offensively, which is probably more famous for, but also defensively. I mean, you guys were tough, you know, and, and ha- held, you know, very, very difficult to, 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 for, for opposing teams to score points on you. And you were kind of the leader of that, of that team. Um, I had Matt Millen on the pod a week ago and Matt and I were teammates of the Raiders. And, you know, it was interesting when he was, when, as we were going through it, Matt ultimately went from the Raiders to the San Francisco 49ers. And he goes, you know, when I was at the Raiders, it was kind of my team. I was the leader. I was a local guy on defense. Um, there was no question about that. And there was a lot of super studs over there, Howie and Lester, you know, all the guys that were on that team. Yep. Uh, yep. And he said that when he went to the 49ers, it was clear that you were the leader. And so he, you know, understood that he took a, a step backwards and, you know, you were the guy calling the signals, telling people where to go. And Matt just played in. And that was part of Matt's greatness of just being able to understand and really see um, the pieces of the puzzle where he was going to fit in. But, you know, amongst all the alpha dogs, when you start getting to that level, you got to have one guy that steps up and is willing to direct that traffic where it's really the coach's coach that's out there, (laughs) you know, directing traffic and being that voice that people are going to listen to when you were that guy. Yeah. But you know what? I'm going to say this, man. Look, I've, I've, I've known Matt for a long time and um, we we still talk and we bump in each other at the wrestling matches and, 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 the great thing that I learned about Matt is that you, when you're built, when you're built to be something and people know that you're built to be something, 
very seldom do you find ways to not allow that person to do his job. Meaning Charles Haley yep. is a great Hall of Famer. And the reason he's a great Hall of Famer, he was built to do something that a lot of people were not able to do. And that is to be able to come off the corner, to be able to not only come off the corner, but also to be able to drop. I mean, he did so many different little things. And Matt was in the same category where you could put Matt in a lot of different situations and he could do a lot of different things. And then the most important thing that he could really do is that, man, he could get you ready to play the game of football. He can get you ready to play the game of life. And one of the great things that I love about Matt is that, you know, the intensity, the intensity of playing sometimes, you think you have it, right? You, we all think we have it. And then all of a sudden you're around somebody like that and you go, whoo, I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to find my way to, to, to match that. And, um, and, and so that's the other thing that I love about sports is that when you have guys like that, or you get a guy like Joe Montana, or you get a chance to play with a guy like Jerry Rice. And what you find is that there are other characteristics that people don't ever get a chance to see that makes them so much better and so much unbelievable that you try to explain it and you try to talk about it and people can't really, they can't really get their arms around it. And yet what makes to me, those guys so special is that they just work harder. They just, they do, they, they're willing to do all the little things that a lot of people are not willing to do. And, and they love what they do. They love it and they try to make it the best that they can be. And and so, yeah, Matt was one of those kind of guys. And then you add on Jerry and you add on Joe. And, and before you know it, you, you can stand around, especially with that team, you can stand around the locker room. And there were a lot of guys that kind of had an alpha type characteristic that just wanted to play and be be the best that they could be in terms of playing football. You know, I, in 1985, um, I went off after the orange Bowl. I went off to the uh, combines and, uh, it was, you know, quote unquote, the year of the wide receiver. And, um, there was all these, I think there was seven guys that were drafted in the first round. And one of those guys was this guy named Jerry Rice. And I didn't think the guy would ever pan out to anything because he'd gone to this little Mississippi state West Valley college, <laughs> someplace I've never heard of. And I just didn't think somebody that came from a small school could actually play the big boys. And, um, you know, I've never been so wrong. Obviously the guy is one of the most phenomenal players. I love to watch him play the one guy though. And this is when I was playing for the saints that I love to just sit there and watch, you know, as an opponent, because, um, obviously we were not on the field as a wide receiver is watch Joe Montana do his thing. And he had just a, just a great, I think, his, I mean, you have this too, but in different ways, but just his sense of intense anticipation to float the ball before the receiver ever turns around and just really understand where you have to be on the field because the guy is not fast. He's not strong. He's not big, you know, but he's just great. And uh, he showed that greatness over a long, long, long career like yourself. You guys actually end up going to four Super Bowls, 81, 84, 88, and 89. Did, were you guys – the core of the team, because I think those last two years, Steve Young was driving the was driving the car. But in those first couple of years, um, or out of the four Super Bowls, which one do you think was your strongest team that you had? Yeah, I think the uh, I think the '84 team was the strongest team we had, just because we had so much depth on the defensive line, and 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 so much we had so many different weapons on our offense. Roger was playing really, Roger Craig was playing yep. really well. Uh, we had Wendell Tyler, who was, you know, just a phenomenal running back that did so many different things. You know, we had Charlie Young as the tight end and, and he was really uh, amazing. We had Freddie Solomon, who was an incredible wide receiver. We had Dwight Clark, 
Yeah. He was really uh, an excellent uh, wide receiver. And we had, you know, we had uh, Ronaldo. I think, no, Ronaldo wasn't on it. Ronaldo was I don't know if he was on that team, but we 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 had Ronaldo Nehemiah. We we had some guys that were just really different and and different meaning that all of them contribute in different ways. And Bill, the thing that I loved about Bill Walsh is Bill was phenomenal at taking what you did really well in saying, okay, we're going to make sure you do that really well, and we're going to find ways to get you the ball. And uh, Dwight Clark, for example, was an incredible receiver because he was a lot like Steve Largent, where he could do a lot of different things in a small area. And a lot of times when you're covering receivers like that, that can move and give you a lot of different moves and, and, and can get away from you in small spaces, Yep. It, 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 to me, I always felt that those kind of receivers didn't have to be fast. What they had to be is quick and they had to be decisive and they had to be able to help the quarterback anticipate where they were going ultimately. And, and, and then the quarterback could get them the ball. And, and it's always that one window, just like in basketball, where Steph Curry might not be the fastest quickest guy but he knows how to get open and when he gets open he's willing to not only catch the ball but he's willing to then shoot it quickly and and that's that's a, a lot of times to me that's what receivers do they they got to find a way to get open they're able to come off that screen they're able to come off of whatever it is and they're able to find ways to you know expose themselves so a guy like joe montana can make a great throw to him one of the things that I, I want to end the football section because, you know, look, we could go on and on and on. I know your time is precious. And, and what I'm really more impressed on, Ronnie, you know, you're always a great guy uh, to me. Uh, you're, you're a phenomenal player. But you've really been able to make, you know, life after football work for you in a very positive way and impacting a lot of different people. Um, before I want to do that, I just want to throw out some some just some some quick stats. Retired in 1995, NFL 75th anniversary team, 14 seasons, 65 interceptions, uh, 14 uh, four Rose Bowls. I'm sorry, four Super Bowls. You won two uh, Rose Bowls. So you just had this unbelievable career. You capped it off with being inducted into the Hall of Fame, All Pro eight times. I mean. Just an amazing. I mean, I don't. I don't know if there's anything more that you could have done. You started the podcast with by by really your dad, you know, challenging you to be the best you can be on every given day, and I think you did that as as it relates to being on the gridiron. Transitioning into life after football, there's a lot of guys that have gone off the cliff, um, and you know it's been a struggle. I think the NFL has a program called the Trust Today. Um, that they've really outlined a lot of programs to help kids, young guys that are coming up and out of football, transitioning, what to do, how to do it, and surrounding mentors like yourself. You have a couple different car dealerships that you've that you've done. You've also um, you advise as ex athletes. One of the things that um, I, I also want to talk to you about is this all star, all stars helping kids. And yeah. what ha- what has all this meant to you in terms of life after football, being able to take what you, you've earned and done and, and between, I'm sure, time and money, giving that back to your community? Well, first of all, I, I think that All-Stars is centered around a very interesting subject, and that is it's around what can you do for others? And, and, and what my dad taught me is what he did so many times and continues to do. And that is, there's always somebody that needs something. There's always some way to help somebody. There's always a way to figure out that you can play a role in somebody's life. And um, I've always been curious about that capability because that's kind of what my mom and dad do. They still go to church and they still serve. They still help people in San Bernardino and Rialto and in that greater area there. And and so what I love is that um, 
they are kind of the kind of the the source of of me trying to do what I'm doing, and that is, you know, taking a taking every kid and hopefully every kid we come in contact with is giving them a chance to see that they could be an all star. Um, I had a great breakfast this morning. There was a young man um, that JG, that a, a buddy of ours who started this project called the Mindful Mindfulness Project over in Richmond, California. I met this kid when he was about, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old. He was telling me about how the kid now is in high school and, and now he's playing at De La Salle and, 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 I, and I'm sitting there going, wow, you know, that, that moment when I had a chance to play a role in this kid's life, he had a chance to sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take what I'm hearing. I'm going to do something with myself. And, and my point is that that's the same thing Deacon Jones did with me. That's the same thing Jim Brown did with me. And, and my point is that you got to keep doing that. We have, that's our responsibility to keep inspiring and to keep letting people know how much we care. And, and when I, when I'm, when I'm, it's so funny, when I'm around Jim Brown. I hear this theme all the time from him about how he's able and what he's trying to do and what he's trying to accomplish, how he wants to be, you know, a person of change, a person that's creating opportunities. And, 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 and so All Stars Helping Kids started in 1989. It still exists. It's still going. And it's all due to the fact that everybody has a chance to be an All Star. And hopefully working with All Stars, you get a chance to do that. So. One thing that I didn't recognize when I started this journey eight years ago was, you know, at the time I was really trying to get my mind clear on where I was in my life and going forward. And and so slowly I started to build a, a little bit of an audience, which has grown in onto, you know, to about 400,000 people now. And, and in the last 14 years, my daughter Amelia has had the seizure condition um, with epilepsy. It's been it's been hard. You know, it's been hard for her in school. She can't drive. She can't ride a bike. And she's 21. She goes to the University of Arizona. She's awesome. But there's just been a lot of challenges around that. And so, um, you know, with this whole Everest thing going off, it was just like I took a time out. You know, last spring, I asked myself. I said, you know, what can I do to help her? And so I reached out to the national. Epilepsy Foundation, and uh, we created this project called Amelia's Everest. And in um, in January, early January, I had an event, held an event here in Sun Valley called Amelia's Everest, and I had Jim Moore and Tom Flick and some other guys that are well known um, here in the community uh, to come. And you know, we filled up a church, and uh, it was it was it was just amazing. And it was just those guys getting to talk about adversity and tenacity and, and commitment and those types of words that really helped her. And then at the very end, she got up there and and you know, with kind of the whole goal of raising twenty nine thousand dollars towards you know her cause. Nothing goes to her but to the National Epilepsy Foundation. But the beautiful thing that came out of it is that when she got up at the end, and you talk about helping others and those others helping others, right? It's a trickle down domino effect. And what happened is when she got up and she told her two minute story, said, hi, I'm Amelia. I'm petrified to be up here, but you know, I have epilepsy and I grew up as a very angry kid. And now I'm in a different place. And it so helps to know that everybody's come here to support me and, and show that love and, and, and appreciation. We probably at the end of that that um, Amelia's Everest event, we probably had eight different families come up to us and say, you know what, we have epilepsy. My daughter has epilepsy. My sister has epilepsy. And nobody ever talks about it. And thank you for bringing this out into the open. And so, you know, all these things have just little teeny tiny ripple effects. And now Amelia can now become a change agent, not just me, you know, because it's not about me, it's about her. But what can I do with whatever I'm up to in my life to really create, you know, some kind of domino effect for somebody else to do something great in life. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful is that she turned a negative into a positive. And not only did she turn a negative into a positive, she's now continuing to be able to have light. And she's not only continuing to have light, 
but for forever. Think about that forever. You said something earlier about what you thought about when you would wake up every day and what you felt that you can do every day. Mm -hmm. One of the great things is that it's moments like this that your daughter is inspiring me and inspiring me to understand that every day I get a chance to go out and find a way to have light, find a way to express the opportunity that just maybe, just maybe that that person can have a better day. And my point about that is that we're in the world of having these kind of situations where we're so blessed to be able to try, to get people just to try, to do something that could be so radically different. And in, 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 and in this world today, we have to be radically different to find moments where we can help and get people to see that there is value in their life and that they do exist for a reason, that they have a purpose for living. And my point about that is that we got to stop the other aspects of allowing ourselves to have the negativity, to have situations where People say we can't. And yes, are we going to fail? Of course. But failure should not be the thing that stops us. It's the opportunity to get back up, dust yourself off, and find a way to see if you can conquer that objective. It happens every day. And there are so many people that make you or help you see that you can do that. My wife, who does that every day, every day, and I'm so thankful that she's in my life because that's how she lives it. She loves finding ways to make this world better. And my point to you is that some people just have the gift. I, I, wish, that I, I wish I had it every day like she does, but she does have it, and I'm still trying to figure it out. And the reason I'm still trying to figure it out is because it's so innate. It's so a part of her soul. And so, yeah, we have these people in our lives that inspire us, help us. And I'm thankful to hear the story about your daughter. That is amazing because there are so many young people that are going to learn how to live a great life and live a great life knowing that they can have a challenge in it and yet live with it and be beautiful and to be able to think about the positive things that can happen in their life. Yeah. So I, I, I had another one of your buddies on the pod. He's become a good friend of mine, Jerry Robinson. And when Jerry came on the pod, um, I said, Jerry, how are you doing? Just like I did with you. And he goes, you know what, Mark, every day I wake up with an attitude of gratitude. And you talked about your wife just being innate with that, having that, you know, that sparkle inside her that she wants to make the world a better place. And I think that's, you know, in part what, what really helps when you have that perspective on gratitude, the word gratitude, and you're, 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 you're thankful for the small things in life, it helps those other things that you think are more important or bigger or it's a problem or a negative, you know, not seem so, so big. And the other thing that you were talking about, which I thought was really cool, is about, you know, kind of giving life to all these little wins when, you know, these different people that you, that you can impact uh, not just you, but then they can turn around, they can imp impact the next person. And the byproduct to all that is that strong why. I mean, my part of my why, yeah, I want to I want to get to the top of the mountain of Mount Everest and, 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 and be the first guy up there. But I can tell you, because it's happened before several times when I'm going up the mountain, I'm fully focused on one step, you know, in front of the other, one step in front of the other, not the top of the mountain. And I'm thinking about those kids of mine, those two girls, you know, I want to come back for them. I want to come back for my loved ones. And I want to make sure that, you know, my why is that I can continue to help 
and and motivate in some way, even if it's it's a small little thing like trying to raise some money for the for the foundation. You know, anything I can do. And I think you know when we start doing that and the things that you're doing, um, it's so important because it just it just it just serves as an example, a positive example in, in, in our community on what we can do. And they're not big things. So the main thing that you've done, Ronnie, is take you, you've taken a step out the door and, and done something positive rather than just sit. And, and, you know, you could easily be kicking back and talking about the old days and the, the four Super Bowls and the all-pro status and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and that's the reason why when I was looking at your story, and I've known you for a long time, the thing that is so impressive is not back in the day when you were living the glory, living the dream, but all these wonderful things that you're doing today. And again, it's not about you, but it's really about you understanding the bigger picture on how you can use what you did in the past to affect the future. Yeah. And I think one of the great things that I love about the guys that I've played with, all of them, all of them are finding ways to make positive change. All of them are looking at their lives and saying, you know, what else can I figure out? What else can I see? What else can I do? And I think one of the great things in life is you are a rookie again. You know, one of the, one of the mm. hard parts in life is when you, when you decide to go and do anything, you have to accept the fact that you're going to be a rookie and you're going to not know and you're not going to be able to understand it and you're going to have to figure it out. How cool is that? How cool is the fact that you get to be a rookie again and you get to figure it out, you get to fail, you get to laugh at yourself, you get to sit there and 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 deal with some of the tough, you know, situations. And and my point is that is something that all of us go through. Everybody has had a rookie moment. Everybody yeah. has gone through something that they've said, "Wow." I didn't know that I was going to have to go through that. And what I love is that that commonality, that commonality in this country is so evident. And I meet so many people that not only use it, but they believe that it's, it, it's part of their purpose. It's part of their value. It's part of who they are. And so I love it because I'll meet people from, all over the globe and you talk to them and why'd you come here i wanted to come here because i i heard about this i heard that i could do this i heard that i can be this and you find that they are able to make that happen and that type of kind of commodity in this country is am amazing and so I love it because I see it I see it in so many different forms and fashions and so many different colors and so many different people and so many different relationships and so many different genders and so many different people who are just going out making it happen and trying to find a way to live their best life. Love that man. I love that. Listen, you are a remarkable guy and uh, you continue to, you know, be the all-star, the all-pro that you've always been. And uh, I, I ask you if you could take on 30 minutes. I've gone about 30 minutes too long. But, you know, this is just one of these conversations that had to happen. And I cannot tell you the amount of people that this podcast reach and, and, uh, uh, and affects in a very positive way. And so, again, it's not about me. It's not about anything I'm doing. It's about you know, having conversations with guys like you and others that serve as inspiration of getting out and doing it and making a very positive impact in our society today. So thank you so much for that. Oh, man, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to hang with you and spend some time. Uh, continue success and continue success to all, all the people that are in your life, man. Make it happen. Yeah. And, and, and finally, uh, where can people find you if they, you know, it might be a USC link or it might be the all-star helping kids linked on Twitter. Where's the best place? The best place is all stars helping kids. That to me, that is the root of who I am, the root of the, uh, of all the things that we try to do. And so yeah, all stars helping kids. If they, if, if you want to reach out to what I'm doing and what's going on in my life, that's a great that's a great place to start. 
All right. All right. We'll do that. We'll put that in the show notes. So listen, you are the one and only running lot. I so appreciate it. Appreciate you. And hopefully we can uh, get together sometime in person out in San Francisco. Okay. All right, Mark, man, you take care, man. Okay, buddy. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.